All right. Let's try and tackle one of the more enigmatic teams in the Overwatch League for 2019, the Chengdu Hunters. Uh, first of all, props to the management of this team for going with a full Chinese team. I think that uh, if all of the teams added to the Overwatch League that were from China had decided to go for majority Korean teams, that would have been a disaster for the uh, for the Chinese scene itself. And it would have been, on, in some sense, a little unfair to them, because I think there are good players in the Chinese scene, enough to construct one, potentially two, uh, good quality OWL teams from. And by good quality, I mean like mid-table at least, like not like really bad at the bottom team. Uh, but, there's always a but, isn't there? Um, I think one of the issues when you have this kind of setup is that the other Chinese teams actually did pick up Chinese players, um, but they may have picked up the best Chinese players and left the full Chinese team with some of the worst. <laughs> or not some of the worst, but some of the second best. So let me try and explain that a little better. The Chinese players that you would expect to see in the Overwatch League are in the Overwatch League, but they are not playing for Chengdu, uh, so to speak. Gu Shui and Crystal, probably the two best... Uh, Chinese players uh, that are in the scene have gone to the Hangzhou Spark, which is a team that, as far as I'm aware, is going to be communicating fully in Korean. So uh, they might not see game time early on in the season. We don't really know what's going to happen with them. And it would be a pity if their talents were wasted, and it would have been awesome to see them on Chengdu, but that's how the cookie crumbles. So Gu Shui and Crystal, two fantastic talents to Spark. Eileen, another fantastic talent, another DPS, flex DPS player to the uh, Guangzhou charge. So, okay, so now you don't have many DPS players that are excellent to pick from because Shy, another fantastic talent, who used to play flex support, was a really, really good Zarya, uh, Zenyatta player and then ended up playing kind of uh, hitscan DPS. Really good hitscan DPS player. He's too young. So is Leave, the other guy that played phenomenally in, uh, in the Chinese World Cup team this year. So, of the... What is that? That's the five... That's who I would consider the five best players in China. And none of them are on Chengdu, the full Chinese team. So, already you can see that something's kind of gone weird here. Um, and this team is not going to be representative of a Chinese super team, for sure. Uh, because Shai and Lee are too young, and the rest have gone to other teams. So, it's not that we've been robbed, and I'm, I think China will still develop from here in 2020, I would expect... Uh, the Chinese seem to actually get stronger rather than weaker, um, which is a nice progression, isn't it, to go from Shanghai to Chengdu to potentially some actual Chinese super team. Um, but I'm glad at least that Chengdu did go for this rather than just creating a, a Korean team. It's worth the punt, I think, at least from a marketing point of view. But where do I really expect them to finish? I've said that they're not going to be a super team. I expect them to be 18th. I've put them 18th in my power ranking. Uh, I've put Justice and... Uh, Florida, I think, beneath them, um, and then Chengdu, and I reasonably expect them to finish anywhere from 20th to maybe about 15th, I think they they have a slightly higher ceiling than the Washington Justice, in my opinion, but um, could, could end up being worse than them, and the reason for this is there are a lot of players that I'm not too familiar with, because I'm not too familiar with the Chinese scene, but also because... Uh, we really haven't seen that much from them. Let's tackle their DPS first. They've got two DPS players that have not played a single match in 2018, right? So already you've gone from potentially constructing a Chinese super team as the only team that's communicating in Mandarin and, you know, representing China in the Overwatch League to that extent that you have a Chinese roster and you're from China. Um, but your DPS players, two of them, the hitscan DPS players, did not play a single game in 2018. Now, they were good when they did play in 2017, um, especially YXL. This guy, um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce his uh, his full name. Something like, no, I, I said I'm not going to try, so I'm not going to try. Uh, he used to play for Miraculous Youngster. He was the hitscan DPS player for them. He used to play a lot of uh, McCree, a Reaper, stuff like this. I mean, that was meta at the time. I think it, very occasionally you would play a little bit of Tracer, um, but I wouldn't expect him to pick that up for this team. He's mostly like your classic hitscan DPS. I, I think he'll probably pick up the Widowmaker as well. I'm not totally sure. I haven't seen him play it in the past, but he probably got it in his wheelhouse because they normally do. Um... So, if he's able to reach the same heights that he did 
back in 2017, then they should have a competent hitscan DPS player on their hands. But it's so much of a risk. You have to catch up with um, a lot of practice that you've missed, so you're already rusty, but people who are good can get back up to that level fairly quickly. Like, over the course of the offseason, you could definitely get back up to where you were previously. But then you also have to account for that year of learning that everybody else has done, you know? Everybody else that's been playing the entire time throughout 2018 has experienced... Um, playing against the best Widowmakers in the world, has experience playing against some of the best Tracers or McCrees or whatever in the world. And that learning is important because it tells you what sightlines you can safely pick. Uh, it tells you um, how you should be set up with your team, when you should ask for damage boost and play with your team, or wh when you should be pocketed by a Brigitte or by a, a Diva, when you should try and go for these risky flanks, how to best get use out of whatever my point is there's a lot of learning that happens as well as just practice and that learning is um a process of playing matches against other really talented people and figuring out what works what they're doing what you can learn from etc and both he both yxl and bacon jack the two hit scan dps players for chengdu have not had any of that so that i see as a big challenge that needs to be uh, surmounted for this team Bacon Jack was more of the Tracer player, played a lot of Tracer. Uh, what else did he play? Ah, I'm going back a long time now. I really can't remember him as much other than a Tracer player, but I'm sure he did have a couple of other heroes in his wheelhouse. I think, again, he was more of a classic hitscan DPS, but really hardcore focused around the Tracer, as far as I can remember. Um, and he was good. He was one of the best, if not the best, Tracer in the Pacific region, kind of up there with I Eat You Up from, uh, from Australia. I don't expect him to be an insane level Tracer, but I do think that he'll be a serviceable Tracer for this team, and probably has a couple of other heroes that I just haven't seen. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there. But again, he has to do so much learning to be able to get up to the level of these other people that have just been playing the game uh, throughout 2018. He was off playing PUBG, so th this is going to be a big change of pace coming back into it. The third DPS player that they have on Chengdu, uh, the guy that's going to be playing the kind of flex DPS role, is Jinmu. And Jinmu is really interesting because, mechanically speaking, he is good. Decision-making speaking, he is suicidal. And when I said this in one of my feature pieces, some, some analysis piece, I think it might have even been to do with my power rankings. People were, like, asking about his mental health or something. Guys, that, that's not what suicidal means if I'm speaking in the context of, like, a, a, a DPS player within the league. It means they're making decisions that are so bold, so brash, that they're throwing their life away, right? They're, like, diving in to try and make plays that have a small percentage chance of working. So the likeliest thing is that they're just going to die. And it was them that caused it. That's the point. That's why I'm saying suicidal. So Jinmu, when he plays um, when he plays Genji, which seems to be his preferred pocket pick, um, although he, he can play a bunch of other uh, kind of the classic projectile um, heroes, it, he definitely seems the most comfortable and the most mechanically skilled on Genji. Um, he plays a very aggressive style, though. Um, and... If he's set up well by the rest of his team, and if the rest of his team follows him in, if they play aggressively alongside him, he can get big dragon blades off. He'll play very aggressively and just dash in and try and get a kill and get the dash reset to be able to exit. But this is like a super risky way of playing Genji um, that the rest of your team has to be on board with for you to be able to uh, play like that. So let's see whether he can develop into a superstar talent. He's either, in my opinion, going to be a superstar or a feeder. He doesn't really, he doesn't seem to have that middle gear where you can be. You know, when you to where you tone it back a little bit and you just play like you're doing all right. He's very much, he's like Agilities on crack. If you've ever watched Agilities where he just dives in with his Dragon Blades and doesn't seem to really pay too much attention to like which cooldowns are available. He's just like, he sees an opening positionally and he goes for it. Um, and that can lead to him getting shut down a lot. Okay, so there's their DPS. So in, th in theory, if they all reach their previous peaks or hit like the best potential that they could, they could actually have a mechanically talented and very aggressive, powerful DPS core. But there's so many issues with that going well. Like, in theory, awesome. In practice, I've got a lot of uh, a lot of worries about how Chengdu's DPS line actually functions. But certainly, the, the potential of stardom is there, which is more than you can say for some of the other teams that are down there at the bottom with them. Their tank line is weird. Weird! Weird. Main tanks... Armeng, who doesn't really play Winston for his, for his team, he plays 
uh, Wrecking Ball majority of the time, plays a little bit of uh, Reinhardt and a little bit of Arissa. Doesn't look comfortable on Rhine, doesn't look particularly comfortable on Arissa. Um, I would not expect him to get much playtime. But was signed early on as their only main tank, so I don't quite know what they were thinking. I imagine that he's been scrimming Winston and other normal main tanks a little bit more now that he's been picked up for an owl team. Um, the other main tank that they've got alongside him is Jishirin. Uh, Jishirin? I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, he used to play for Miraculous Youngster as well, alongside YXL and Late Young, um, who... and. No, he played on Team CC with Kyo as well. Anyway, he's got a little bit of uh, synergy with some of these other people, but as a main tank in himself, uh, he used to, on Miraculous Youngster, play a lot of Reinhardt, and it wasn't an aggressive style of Reinhardt. It was quite passive. He was meant to kind of hold the fort while the rest of the people were battling for him. He was really a protector, you know, in, in the classic sense. He was Big Rectangle Man. He was protecting the DPS that were coming alongside him and the Zarya. He would always play alongside a Zarya in Miraculous Youngster, pretty much. Um, so, times have really changed, <laughs> and they've shifted him onto Winston a lot when he's been playing in Chinese Contenders. Hasn't looked that great. Has been looking... Um, like, he's been playing a little too aggressively and getting caught out in a lot of situations. Doesn't have the greatest decision-making. Certainly, right, let me put it like this. He's not a Gushui 2.0, right? So that's all you need to know because every other main tank in China is way below what you would consider a normal owl level. He's not going to be one of the greatest main tanks in the league and may actually prove to be a liability for them. And that's not really helped by the off-tank situation, in my opinion, because they've got two off-tanks. One, Late Young, who played with Miraculous Youngster and then Team CC, I think, with Jashirin. Um, and has a good Zarya, but you wouldn't normally play him for his D.Va. He was actually playing in Team China as well and didn't have the greatest D.Va, but they still made it work because they had such an aggressive style. So maybe if they can create a style that's super aggro, plays around Jin Mu and Jishirin, and they're just in your face all the time, and Late Young's just there just trying to defense Matrix them and add his own pressure as well, and he doesn't have to worry about... Um, we're, uh, wondering what the positioning of everybody is and making the most clutch reads and being able to defend his backline all the time. Maybe then he'll be okay. But I wouldn't expect him to get the most playtime. I would expect Elsa to get playtime, who actually seems to be a fairly competent diva. Um, it's hard to rate diva players, especially when you only have a little bit of VOD footage and you can't see the defense metrics very well and you can't really see what they're up to. And the team's playing like a Chinese contenders team as well. They play a very chaotic style. Um, but it does seem like Elsa would be the better diva of the two. Still not a world-class diva, still not a world-class tank line. I think this could be a liability for them, which is why I think they need to uh, hope that their DPS does incredibly well, and they just need to kind of play this mad aggro style to try and get the best out of them. Their backline, though, does actually look pretty competent, which is... This sounds rude, but I genuinely mean it. It's a little bit rare for Chinese teams to have a competent backline, and I think it's something that separates the uh, idea of Chinese teams being weak and, like, all over the place and chaotic from teams like uh, the Chinese team of the World Cup. The Chinese team of the World Cup had a lot of stability. They knew exactly when to do everything. They had a very solid backline. And I think part of that beca was because they had somebody who was very good at being able to play Anna and Zen, had somebody who was very good at being able to play Mercy and Lucio when it was required, and were able to pair the two of them up and keep like a functional structured system working where they could keep everyone healed and get peeled for when required. They also had really good tanks as well. So that really does help with the peeling. But leaving the tank aspect aside, I think whoever Chengdu fields will be uh, quite significantly better than some of the other backlines at the bottom of the table. If you compare the backline to Justice backline or Mayhem backline, uh, actually, they're the only two that, are, that I think are, are, are really going to underperform. I think Eveltal, or Eveltal, or however he's supposed to pronounce his name, um, is is a good main support, I think will do well with this team, um, can play the Mercy very well, uh, can also play Lucio, um, and he's going to be supporting Kyo or Gary, whoever they pick. I'm not 100% sure who they're going to go for here. When I was watching uh, VODs of both of these guys, it doesn't look like there's a massive difference between Kyo and Gary. Maybe they'll stick with Kyo, I think he has slightly better synergy with some of the rest of the team, but Gary might be a better individual Zen, not, not, not totally sure. But they seem to be on a roughly similar level. I don't think they're going to be world-class Zenyatta players, but I do think they're going to be 
capable, going to be able to look after themselves if the DPS aren't looking after them. If the DPS aren't coming back to heal, you need a backline that can look after yourself. And I think Kyo or Gary and Evolta will be able to do that. And they have to develop the synergy with that D.Va, with that main tank, to be able to come back and peel for them. But if they get that working, they actually have an all right ce uh, ceiling. But I think their best chance is not going pound for pound against these other teams in the league. I think they should play some weird Chinese shit. And there's a lot of weird Chinese shit. If you've ever watched the Chinese scene, it is notorious for coming out with strange strategies. They had this quad DPS stuff. In fact, let's go through it. They came up with an anti-dive setup before anti-dive existed with Miraculous Youngster that caught off guard a bunch of top teams and ended up beating Runaway in an online cup. Um... And then they played in the Seoul Super Cup and did actually fairly well against Lunatic High, I think it was. Um, although they did lose that game. Uh, then they, the Chinese scene uh, started messing around with Sombra before anybody was really messing around with her. Integrating her into a ton of different compositions. And the, the interesting thing about China is they, they have good ideas. But then their coordination is so batshit that they can't actually make the good idea function within a system. So I think... If, they, if you can manage to create a, a team that can take those good ideas, take the innovation, take the creativeness, take the craziness that the Chinese scene is known for, and actually have good coordination and skill, and be able to run those cheesy, creative strategies in a really coordinated, snappy way, that's where Chengdu are going to be able to steal wins off the other teams. But that's quite a tall order, really. It's difficult to try and create a team like that. Ryu was the main head coach for the uh, Miraculous Youngster. So he's got um, he's got some experience doing this kind of thing. Um, was uh, uh, for a short time also coaching the Shanghai Dragons, but left because of health issues halfway through the season. But I think he's got a big challenge here. He needs to make them play proper Overwatch, where you're properly coordinated, you're peeling for your backline, everybody's in sync, you know what the plan is, you know if somebody takes uh, advantage of an opportunity, you're there to be able to back them up, you've got good coordination, but you're also able to play weird stuff. You're able to catch people off guard with how aggressive and how out of the box you're playing. I am thinking a style like Team China from this year's World Cup, where they could overwhelm them with... Um, with two really strong DPS players and a really strong main tank. Now, they don't have the main tank to be able to do it here. But if Jikarin and uh, Jishirin and Elsa can play aggressively anyway, maybe they can still find wins out of playing that kind of un uh, uh, unusual style. Unfortunately, as much as I've been optimistic about Chengdu so far, there are quite a number of potential downsides. I mean, their, their entire roster could just collapse. Um... The DPS players could end up being all over the place and terrible. There's a really significant chance of that happening. Their tank line could be one of the worst in the league. I think it's certainly got um, a, a genuine possibility of that being the case. Um, and they might not find this coordination. They're also in the Pacific Division. And that means the next worst team in the division is either the Shanghai Dragons or the Guangzhou Charge, however you want to slice that up. And... They're going to be a lot better than some of these other Atlantic teams. Um, so they might just get bodied all season long. So a reminder of how the format works. You, Chengdu have to play twice against every team in the Pacific. That means they play twice against Shock, against Valiant, against Soul, against uh, Gladiators, against uh, Dragons, against Charge. Who else? Somebody else. Against Titans as well. They I mean, there are a lot of good teams in the Pacific. The Pacific Division, in my opinion, makes up probably like the... Apart from the top three, it makes up the, the, the rest of the top half of the table. Um, so, it, Chengdu are in an unfortunate position where there really aren't that many other teams for them to practice on, apart from the ones in the Atlantic Division, like Mayhem, Paris, Washington, maybe Houston. So, uh, their schedule is going to be a little bit difficult coming into it, but we'll see what they can do.